Two. Cha cha. Two. Yeah. Cha cha. Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're going to be waiting just one moment while everyone enters the room and then we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right, good evening and welcome if you're just joining us to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I am happy to see all of you tonight. We will be starting in just a couple minutes. Yay, John. Yay, good, John. good evening and welcome. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us. I am Tara Johnson Nome, and I am your host for tonight's Northern Kentucky History Hour. We are so glad to have you with us tonight. Just a couple of housekeeping items while everyone is joining us. Um, you will find that your uh, microphone has been muted, um, but we do want everyone to participate. So if you have any questions or need anything, please indicate that in the chat and then we will uh, get your question answered. It might be at the end of the presentation, but we will definitely get that answered. Um, also, if you want to turn off your video, you're welcome to do that. It's nice to see your smiling faces, but um, just let everybody know we can also see you even when the presentation is being shared. Um, this program is a program project of Berenger Crawford Museum, which is your local history museum for Northern Kentucky. If you would like to find out more about Berenger Crawford, you can go to our website, bcmuseum. Dot org, and we encourage you to do that and find out about upcoming holiday events that we have going on. There's some really fun things that the staff is in store. Um, I also see some of my fellow board of trustee members here on tonight's episode, and so I just want to say thank you to them. Thank you to the staff. Uh, thanks to everyone who has helped out to make this uh, Northern Kentucky History Hour project possible, and that includes some of our financial supporters. Uh, Baird Crawford Museum is supported by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, and the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation. So thanks to all of them, and thank you to all of you who have become members. Um, many of you, I see names of people who have joined and become members during this really critical uh, time in the pandemic when we need your support the most. And so we just wanna say thank you so much for that. Um, and again, if, uh, if you wanna become a member, that bcmuseum.org website will also help you find out how. Um, if you have missed any of our past episodes of Northern Kentucky History Hour, we've had other authors, archeologists, a number of individuals, and you can watch all of those on our Facebook page and on YouTube. So without further ado, I would love to introduce you to tonight's guest, Stuart Sanders. He is the author of four books, including his newest work, Murder on the Ohio Bell, Paraville Under Fire, The Aftermath of Kentucky's Largest Civil War Battle is another one of his books, The Battle of Mill Springs, Kentucky, and Maney's Confederate Brigade at the Battle of Paraville. He is the former executive director of the Paraville Battlefield Preservation Association, and he has written for a wide variety of magazines and journals. His op-ed pieces about Kentucky history regularly appear in newspapers across the Commonwealth. Stuart? Well, Tara, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm a huge fan of the Berenger Crawford Museum. I've worked with, with Lori Risch and uh, Gary Johnston and also John Bowe over the years. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun to see some of those people here. And also uh, seeing Katie Jo Kirkpatrick on this call is fun too. We were uh, it's center together. So it's uh, great to see some friendly faces on here. Um, if you guys could be patient with me for just a second, I'm gonna go ahead and share my, my screen here and then I'll, I'll get started. And uh, let's see, whoops, if you guys can, uh, can see this. But a few years ago, when I was actually researching another book project, um, I found myself scrolling through online newspapers when I was doing some research. And 
Um, while digging through an, an issue from 1856, I stumbled upon a, a short article that essentially was about a dead man who was found floating in the, uh, in the Mississippi River tied to a chair. And, you know, that story sort of immediately caught my attention and, and literally caught me by surprise. And I wondered, you know, what happened to this person who had been responsible for his death? Um, what had caused him to be tied up and thrown into the river to suffer? And, you know, all these questions started, you know, swirling through my mind. And, you know, I initially uh, put that other book project on hold and started digging into that story. And the result of this is my new book, Murder on the Ohio Bell. And it essentially examines two killings that took place in 1856 on board a Cincinnati-based steamboat that plied the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, delivering passengers and freight from Cincinnati to New Orleans and back. And I quickly realized that this story, which um, includes the history of the steamboat Ohio Bell, really went beyond the two murders. And in addition to examining interpersonal violence in these two killings, the book also explores vigilante justice, Southern honor culture, the tensions that existed along the Ohio River border during the antebellum period, fugitive slaves, the Civil War, and much, much more. And today, I really want to tell you the story about why that man came to be thrown into the river tied to a chair. And I also want to talk about some of those larger themes that I mentioned and, and how they really affected life in the Ohio River Valley during the mid-19th century. But first and foremost, who was that drowned man and how did he meet that terrible fate? Well, on March 14, 1856, the Ohio Bell, which was a, a side wheel uh, steamboat, arrived at the town of Smithland, Kentucky to pick up goods and passengers. And Smithland is located on the Ohio River near Paducah. And at the time, uh, all the passengers on the boat, the Ohio Bell, were talking about Matilda Heron, who's pictured here, who was a famous actress who was on board the vessel. Um, Heron was born in, in, uh, in Ireland, had moved to Pennsylvania. And when she was a little bit older, she ended up moving to Europe to study acting. And when she was in London, she ended up watching a, a play called Camille that was written by Alexander Dumas, who we know is, you know, writing The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. And, and uh, the story is about a, a courtesan who uh, is dying from tuberculosis. And Matilda Heron became sort of infatuated with the story and actually had it translated from French into English. And then she began her career acting and performing the role of Camille up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to rave reviews. And, you know, she actually became um, uh, known throughout the United States and, and modern historians of the theater really credit her for inventing the emotional school of acting. And it was said that, you know, when she, she uh, played the role of, of Camille, people in the audience would actually weep as she portrayed this, this courtesan who was dying from tuberculosis. So um, because of her fame, really only a handful of the passengers on board the Ohio Bell noticed a ragged but fashionably dressed Mississippian climb on board at, at Smithland, Kentucky. Now this Mississippian said his name was J.B. Jones. He said he was the son of a prominent planter from Holly Springs, Mississippi. And there was one man on board who actually remembered Jones uh, climbing on the, the Ohio Bell. And he wrote, when the steamer arrived, there came on board a man who was evidently recovering from a drinking spree. His clothes were of good material and fitted him well, though they were somewhat impaired by use. His face was soiled and his beard had grown to an uncomely length. His eyes were bloodshot and glared unnaturally. His linen needed a change. Now this Mississippian, again named Jones, was rumpled. He had a high-born swagger, sort of denoting that he was the son of a prominent planter and he appeared to be intoxicated. And when he lurched on board the Ohio Bell, he really presented himself as a uh, Southern man of means. Now, residents of Smithland who watched the Ohio Bell pull away would have been really familiar with this vessel, as would have you know, residents of communities up and down the Ohio River. At least three vessels named Ohio Bell had plied the Cincinnati to New Orleans trade route um, since the late 1830s. And one boat essentially replaced the other one during that time. And so they were the three different Ohio Bells were constructed in 1839, 1843, and 1855. And each successive bell replaced the other one and increased in size and as river passage became more important for the growth of the nation. Now, around that time in 1856, there were actually about 700 steamboats traveling on Western waters and that included uh, the Ohio Bell. And now pictured here is the 1843 uh, version of the Ohio Bell. Um, and this image comes from, a lot of you have probably seen it. It's an 1848 panoramic image that the Cincinnati Public Library has of the Cincinnati Riverfront. It's incredible. 
you know, this is uh, uh, basically one sort of tight zoom in of, of, of the river, but it, it includes the entire panorama of the Cincinnati Riverfront. And I'd encourage you guys to check that out. And, you know, this is sort of an incredible image that really shows what a cityscape would have looked like in the uh, 18, uh, 1840s. Now, although steamboat trade was important for economic growth, as we all know, you know, as Western expansion happened really thanks to the steamboat in many ways. Um, and while steamboats allowed Cincinnati, Louisville, and other river towns to grow from the 1830s to the 1850s, you know, this type of travel, as many of you know, was not without risk. First, steamboats could run into snags uh, or other underwater obstacles and sink. And since many uh, 19th century Americans didn't know how to swim, you know, this was a, a fairly terrifying experience if your boat ended up running into a, a snag and proved to be a dangerous ordeal. Uh, moreover, with each boat having massive furnaces and boilers on board that, that powered these vessels up and down the rivers, the risk of fire or explosions was really ever present. And this picture here shows uh, the explosion of the Alfred Thomas, which was a, a Pennsylvania based um, uh, boat that exploded in the 1860s. So it gives you sort of an idea of, of what an explosion would have been like. So boilers were never fully constructed properly. Um, there was little regulation. There was inconsistent metal strength. And so, you know, with, without any safety standards during this period, um, as a historian named Laura Davis has explained, about 21% of all antebellum riverboats either burned or exploded. So think about that, you know, one fifth of these vessels either, either caught fire or, uh, or, or blew up. Um, and as you can imagine, this led to hundreds of deaths. Even Mark Twain's brother, you know, the great chronicler of, of Mississippi River travel, um, Mark Twain was not immune from tragedy because his brother died in a steamboat explosion in 1858 on board a steamboat called the Pennsylvania. Um, so because of explosions, because of fires, ice in the rivers, the danger of snags, you know, most steamboats that were traveling the Ohio and Mississippi actually only survived for about five years. That was the average age um, of steamboats during this period, which is, you know, pretty hard to imagine. So the three boats that traveled uh, under the name Ohio Bell from 1839 until the 1860s also faced the risk of fires, explosion, and other you know, underwater obstacles. Um, records are scant, but it appears that the first Ohio Bell, which was constructed in Cincinnati in 1839, probably fell victim to either a fire or a snag. Again, here's the uh, Ohio Bell um, picture here from, this is the 1845 version. And this boat's pretty interesting too. It was part of a, uh, an 1845 fugitive slave case. It was based in Cincinnati that I describe in my book. Um, this version was actually destroyed at some point, too. It looks like in 1854, um, this boat actually burned up. Shortly thereafter, though, the third boat uh, to bear the name Ohio Bell was, was uh, built in Cincinnati and was put on the river. It was called an elegant passenger packet, and it was on that vessel, uh, the one built in 1854, uh, that the intoxicated Mississippian J.B. Jones climbed aboard uh, in March 1856. So when Jones, again, this you know Mississippian staggered on board, he immediately went to the uh, onboard saloon and, and began drinking liquor. Now, at approximately 11 a.m., while the boat was between Smithland and Cairo, Illinois, Jones stumbled out of the saloon and he went to the boat's barber to get a, a shave. And to pay uh, his bill for the shave, he ended up presenting the boat's clerk with a $20 bill. Now, the boat's clerk, uh, his name was Hiram Stevens. He was a, a Cincinnati resident. He'd you know, worked for years and years on board different boats. He was actually a captain of a riverboat at one point. But when he looked at this bill, he decided it was counterfeit. Um, he, he didn't recognize it, so he returned it to J.B. Jones, this Mississippian, and refused to accept it. So to pay for this shave, Jones then handed the clerk a $10 bill. Well, the clerk again said, I'm sorry, I can't accept this. This is counterfeit. Now, when Stevens, the clerk, rejected this money the second time, Jones, the Mississippian, just flew into a rage. He became furious. One witness later wrote that, quote, the strange man flew, as it were, into a rage and rushed out of the barber shop in a wild and desperate manner. Now, Jones encountered the clerk again, and he asked, you know, why is the bill, why do you think the bill isn't right? And he said, look, I've been on the river a long time. I know that this is a forgery. Now, Jones became more and more enraged, ended up screaming and cursing at the boat's clerk, Hiram Stevens. And a reporter later wrote that Jones, quote, paced the cabin, abusing the boat and Captain Stevens particularly via language in the hearing of the ladies. Now, Stevens told the Mississippian to calm down or else he'd remove him from the cabin. But Jones, however, kept ranting. And finally, 
Stevens grabbed the Mississippian by the arm and forcibly removed him from the cabin and told him he'd vi violated the rules of the boat and essentially manhandled him out of the room. And, and to Jones, who again was the son of a prominent Mississippi planter, this was a grave offense and sort of uh, scalded his honor and, and you know, bruised his honor. Um, Stevens would, you know, would have been considered a, a more lower class clerk at that time. And since he put his hands on the upper class Jones and again, forced him out of the cabin, this was a, a, a terrible insult to this Mississippian. Um, during the 19th century, the code of honor sort of, um, there were varying degrees of, of, if you were a white Southern male of, of a certain class, you know, there were varying degrees of what you should do and how you should respond if someone from a different class treated you poorly. And typically it meant that an immediate response had to happen. While this was often a caning or a horse whipping, uh, this time the inebriated J.B. Jones, instead he pulled a pistol and he met, met with this front, met with this affront immediately. Um, he basically pulled a gun and ended up shooting the clerk Hiram Stevens in the chest and basically killed him instantly. Stevens fell, died in about 15 minutes. And a Cincinnati newspaper later wrote that Stevens was extensively known and respected and beloved in the community. Now, after shooting Stevens, Jones turned and ran. Now, Jones's murder of Stevens really proves that even though steamboats were sort of these luxurious surroundings that people love traveling in, um, they were not free from violence. And as you can imagine, the shooting on board the Ohio Bell was not an, an isolated incident. And instead, as, and as a reflection of 19th century society in general, Stephen's death on board the Bell was just one of many acts that were uh, perpetrated on Western rivers, including the Ohio River. Now, like the general public, crew members and passengers could have a propensity for violence. In addition, as you know, this story tells, the combination of alcohol and concealed weapons on board can also prove to be a volatile mix. There were fights, shootings, intentional drownings, uh, fatal beatings with firewood, and other lethal episodes that occurred despite these you know, sort of luxurious surroundings that existed on board steamboats. Now, hostility between crew members could also lead to homicide. It wasn't always sort of passenger on passenger crime or passenger on crew crime. Sometimes these crew members also uh, got into scrapes that led to murder. In 1846, for example, there was a uh, fireman on board the Ohio Mail, and uh, um, they're the ones who would sort of load up the boats with wood. He got in an argument with the engineer on the boat, and the fireman actually picked up a piece of firewood, or the engineer knocked, picked up a piece of firewood and hit the fireman and actually uh, killed him. Um, the engineer ended up fleeing the boat when it arrived in Louisville. Um, in another incident in 1859, a man named Owen Dennigan stabbed and killed John Moore, who was a fireman on board the W.A. Violet, another uh, Ohio River steamboat. Now, Dennigan actually slipped off the boat and escaped. Um, other perpetrators who tried to avoid capture were not so fortunate. And again, at a time when a uh, few people actually learned how to swim, escaping from a moving steamboat was certainly a dangerous proposition. In 1852, as the steamboat called the Yuba traveled from Cincinnati to New Orleans, um, one passenger became troublesome, it was said. And this was a scene very reminiscent of what happened to the clerk Hiram Stevens on board the Ohio Bell. And in this incident, a watchman named William Jenkins, who was basically an onboard policeman, uh, took this traveler out of the cabin and the you know, uh, unruly passenger ended up pulling a, a Bowie knife and stabbed Jenkins, killing him. Now the murderer jumped overboard to escape and was found drowned in the river the next day. Now, things were different on board the Ohio Bell. Now, when the Mississippian Jones had shot Stevens, he, of course, made a, a terrible mistake. Not only had he killed a man, but there was really no way for him to escape except to jump overboard. And with the gun still in his hand, he ended up running around the boat, being pursued by the passengers and crew who eventually caught him up on the top deck. When they captured him, they actually knocked him to the ground and they beat him severely. Uh, the scene soon became extremely chaotic. Passengers crowded around uh, the, the murderer, calling for him to be either drowned or hanged. Others, however, wanted legal justice to prevail. And they really begged for Jones to be taken to a town along the Ohio River or the Mississippi River and uh, tried for that murder. Um, however, the presence of actress Matilda Heron, who was on board, again, this famous woman who performed this uh, uh, role with great emotional dexterity and depth, it was said, she ended up saving Jones's life. They were basically preparing to put a noose around his neck when she made a strong appeal on behalf of Jones and did this very emotional appeal, as you can imagine, as a trained actress can. And they ended up deciding not to hang Jones. And instead they said they would 
um, allow him to go somewhere for trial as soon as they could. So he was essentially, thanks to this famous actress, he was spared from the hangman's noose. So the pleas of those who called for justice were actually answered. His life was spared. But as you can imagine, this Mississippian was not treated with kid gloves on board the Ohio Bell after he killed a crew member. Now, if you think about it, anyone who uh, knows how to t tie a knot, it's a sailor. And so what these, these crew members did, they actually bound him from head to toe with one rope. And they actually tied the rope into his mouth and just sort of treated him very uh, severely, as you can imagine. You know, um, he was left, as one reporter said, in the greatest agony. They would not lynch him, uh, but they would make sure that he suffered for the death of their fellow crew member. They then took the bound killer below deck, put him in a chair and left him there, prepared to take him uh, uh, to trial somewhere else, else along the river. As you can imagine, even though it sounds terrible, Jones at this point was, was one of the lucky ones. Lynching and shipboard justice was not uncommon and robbery, violence and murder was not taken lightly. And crew members often took the law into their own hands. Lawbreakers on steamboats were, were typically flogged, whipped, or beaten before they were put on shore. And sometimes they were even left on islands in the Mississippi and Ohio rivers with nowhere to go. Um, others had their heads shaved to brand them as criminals. Um, and again, you know, more like this, this Mississippi and Jones actually faced hanging or drowning at the hands of angry crew members. In 1841, there was a, a, a passenger on a Mississippi River steamboat named Edward Jarvis who found out that thieves were creeping into staterooms at night and were using their knives to cut open pockets of passengers and were stealing their money that way. Um, two of them were captured. They were actually um, beaten fairly severely and then were put uh, ashore by the captain and the crew. In another incident on the boat, the Chancellor, um, five men were actually uh, whipped on board for stealing from other passengers. So, you know, captains were sort of the uh, rulers of the roost on board. They were the administrators of justice. And typically, if you were you're caught doing a crime on board one of these 19th century steamboats, you faced fairly severe uh, punishment. Now, all of this sort of uh, crew perpetrated violence and sort of this mob mentality was actually reflected in 19th century um, society as part of cities along Ohio, along the Ohio and Mississippi River. So, you know, what was going on on the Ohio Bell is really not surprising when you look at what was occurring in towns um, across these rivers. Now, um, in the 1850s, mob violence occurred in, in Cincinnati, it occurred in Louisville, and again, all of these uh, communities up, up and down Western waters. Some of you may be familiar with Bloody Monday, which is pictured here, and uh, this were essentially xenophobic Election Day riots that occurred in Louisville in August of 1855, just a few months before Jones killed Hiram Stevens on board the Ohio Bell. And on this Election Day in Louisville in 1855, Members of the American or the Know Nothing Party, as they're known, um, members of this party ended up attacking German and Irish uh, citizens to prevent them from voting. False rumors had spread that these recent immigrants were, uh, were uh, basically hoarding weapons and were going to be prepared to attack American voters, American party voters on election day. And this sort of, you know, sort of small bouts of violence ended up spinning out of control in Louisville in 1855. Um, Essentially, gangs ransacked German and Irish-owned businesses. They burned up uh, breweries. They even uh, started to attack some churches. And eventually, this episode became known as Bloody Monday. And the worst episode is pictured here. And that's when the mob ended up burning down a series of Irish-owned businesses in downtown Louisville. It's known as Quinn's Row. And as uh, the Irish residents sort of came pouring out of these burning buildings, uh, the American Party members actually shot them dead in the street. And we don't know how many people actually died. Um, in these episodes of violence, but it was surely dozens and dozens. And this actually affected the population of Cincinnati because after this, after this terrible violence, a number of Irish and German immigrants ended up moving to Cincinnati uh, to avoid you know, the threat of, of future violence. Cincinnati, of course, was not immune to sort of mob rule and, and mob perpetrated violence either. In uh, 1841, there's a, uh, well, there's a story named Zachary Bennett who's written about an 1841 episode in Cincinnati in which uh, um, it really involved sort of terrible mob rule. And at the time in 1841, the Ohio River was incredibly low. And this meant that river workers were idle. You know, there wasn't any work for them to do. And when rumors spread that an African-American man had stabbed and killed a young white boy, these workers became furious. They were, these white workers became furious and ended up ransacking um, African-American neighborhoods. And then they attacked an abolition newspaper in town and ended up throwing the press in the Ohio River. So. You know, again, the violence, the sort of mob mentality and mob violence that was perpetrated against Jones on the Ohio Bell 
is again a reflection of these communities up and down the Ohio River, like Louisville and Cincinnati. So again, these residents and the passengers and crew of the Ohio Bell would have been familiar with these stories. Bloody Monday happened just you know shortly before this um, murder. And when the Mississippian killed the boat's clerk, some on board really believed that vigilante justice was the appropriate way to uh, um, deal with Jones in this issue. So what, what actually happened to J.B. Jones? Um, first of all, the captain of the boat, uh, who's a Louisville native named John Sebastian, tried to leave him at Cairo, Illinois for trial. However, lawyers in Cairo told the captain that courts would likely release Jones because the killing happened outside of their jurisdiction. Um, moreover, uh, claims of self-defense, especially when it involved an upper-class man dealing with a lower-class person, a lower-class victim, a lot of those uh, claims of self-defense, men were acquitted making those. So the crew began to think, you know, it's likely that if we leave Jones anywhere, he's going to he's going to be uh, acquitted of this murder. But Sebastian decided to take Jones to Hickman, Kentucky, for trial. And while the boat was docked at Cairo, Sebastian hired an express company. Uh, to ship the, the body of H.E. Stevens, this murdered uh, clerk, back up to Cincinnati. And three days after his death, he was buried in uh, Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. One newspaper wrote that, quote, all of the steamboats at the Cincinnati Wharf had their flags at half mast in token of respect to the deceased. He was an excellent businessman and generally esteemed. Now a widow and four children survived for H.E. Stevens. And this is uh, you know, a, a, a newspaper notice about, about his death and his burial. Now, um, J.B. Jones, the Mississippian, actually never made it to Hickman, Kentucky, for trial. He never faced trial for murdering the clerk. And on the night that the boat left Cairo, instead, Jones disappeared from the Ohio Bell. Although passengers and crew um, claimed they never knew what had happened to him, um, his corpse was later found bobbing by a sandbar in the Mississippi River tied to a chair. And again, that's the story that I found that really got me interested in writing this book. Now, the crew, passengers, or either a combination of the two, had decided to extract their own form of justice against Jones. And again, this sort of reflects as lynchings were going on up and down the Ohio River. This is really not surprising that this happened to the Mississippian. There is, however, a twist in the story. After Jones's corpse was pulled from the river, it was discovered that he really wasn't who he said he was. Now, although he was from Holly Springs, Mississippi, J.B. Jones was not his real name. Um, instead, he was on the run from his terrible past. He was traveling the rivers under an assumed name uh, to try to avoid justice um, from another crime that he had committed um, just shortly before he was killed on board the Ohio Bell. Now, you know, ironically, even though he was on the run, um, a sort of cruel extra legal justice ended up befalling him when he committed this crime on board the Ohio Bell. But, you know, again, as, as this lynching proves on board the Ohio Bell, he could, could not flee from punishment at the hands of the crew. Now, uh, tonight I actually won't reveal Jones's true identity and that horrible story of, of what he had done um, to you all. I'll, I'll leave that to, to readers of the book. I'll be cruel and sort of leave that, uh, you know, sort of story hanging out there for you to discover on your own. But um, I do want to tell you what sort of happened to one of the most important characters in the book, and that is the Steamboat Ohio Bell. And since you all, you know, are in a wonderful Ohio River town, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about um, the Cincinnati built boat and kind of its experience to sort of give you an idea of what these steamboats is once, you know, went by Covington constantly, these boats that sort of travel the Ohio River constantly, you know, what did they experience um, um, during the 19th century? Now, after this murder on board and after Jones was thrown into the river and drowned, um, the Ohio Bell, you know, immediately began hauling passengers and freight from Cincinnati to New Orleans. And in March 1860, for example, the steamboat took a load to Cincinnati that included bacon, hams, onions, potatoes, cheese, candles, sausages, whiskey, plows, you know, the list of goods that these boats carry just goes on and on and on. But as we know, in 1860, sectional tensions were growing terrible between the North and the South um, over slavery. And, you know, slavery and the Civil War eventually interrupted the profitable trade that was running on these rivers, um, you know, the Ohio and the Mississippi. Now, it's interesting because when the Civil War erupted and when Southern states began seceding from the Union, the Ohio Bell continued to haul freight and people up and down the rivers. And even though the Ohio Bell was an Ohio, it was an Ohio owned boat, um, the vest, and even though you know, Louisiana and other states from the deep south had seceded, the Ohio Bell kept running from Cincinnati to New Orleans. So during this secession crisis, in a really weird way, you know, river traffic uh, uh, was kept up and this commerce sort of continued despite, you know, the Civil War that was happening. 
So um, in April 1861, though, uh, travel became problematic as northern owned boats were stopping at southern ports. And as you can imagine, this is sort of not surprising at all, you know, and but for me, this is a very fascinating part of the secession crisis, thinking about, you know, Ohio owned vessels traveling down to Louisiana and making stops while uh, the nation is essentially, um, you know, fracturing at that point. So on April 15th, 1861, the Ohio Bell was docked at Evansville, Indiana, where it was loading uh, freight and passengers for another trip down to Louisiana. Now, three days earlier, um, as you all know, Southern forces at Charleston Harbor had fired upon the Union garrison at Fort Sumter. Now, the fort surrendered the next day, um, and while the Bell was waiting at Evansville, President Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 troops from loyal states to crush the rebellion. Um, Texas had seceded in February, joining Louisiana and six other states. And after Lincoln's call for the 75,000 troops, that essentially pushed the Upper South to also secede. So you have Virginia, you have Tennessee, and you have Arkansas and North Carolina basically leaving the Union after Lincoln's call for those troops. So even though the Union was falling apart at this time, the Ohio Bell uh, then began their journey southward in April of 1861, you know, hoping to probably make one more trip before the Civil War erupted. Um, they ended up reaching New Orleans on April 21st. So although the, although the downriver passage uh, was initially peaceful, when the boat unloaded freight at New Orleans, the crew essentially found themselves swept up in the conflict. Now, upstream, Cincinnati's and Memphis had blocked the Mississippi River, and pro-Confederate residents knew that the Ohio Bell and other northern-owned boats were soon leaving New Orleans to return home uh, northward. And a lot of these secessionists really vowed to seize these boats for the good of the South. Now, at this time, there was sort of an interesting kind of game of tit for tat going on along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. It was essentially, if you seize my property, I'll then seize yours. And in May of 1861, residents of Cairo, Illinois, actually confiscated about $175,000 worth of weapons. They were bound for Tennessee when they captured a Southern steamboat called the C.E. Hillman. Now, in response, secessionists hoped to detain the Ohio Bell and other Northern owned vessels um, until reparations were made. But after leaving New Orleans, the Ohio Bell stopped in Napoleon, Arkansas, you know, a very small river town. Um, there was essentially a wood yard that was, would feed these steamboats wood so they could continue their journey up the river. Now, several weeks early, Cincinnati residents had seized arms, ammunition, and even a cannon or four cannon that were intended for secessionist forces down in Arkansas. Now that state's governor pictured here, Henry M. Rector just became furious. He blamed the confiscation on what he called, quote, the people of Cincinnati having instinctive proclivities toward public plunder. Now you all probably know more Cincinnatians than I do, so I'll leave it to you to determine whether or not they still have this proclivity for public plunder. But for the sake of our story tonight, you know, Rector became determined to avenge this insult. The Cincinnatians, um, you know, took these weapons that were meant for Arkansas troops. He became enraged and he ordered uh, um, local militia to basically seize any northern owned votes or any boats that were owned by Cincinnatians. This included the Ohio Bell. And when the boat arrived in Napoleon, Arkansas, armed secessionists actually poured on board and overtook the northern owned Ohio Bell and captured it and converted it into a Confederate service. So even though the Ohio Bell, a Cincinnati boat uh, with a northern name, Ohio Bell, ended up becoming a Confederate boat for nearly a year, it became a hospital ship, it transported Confederate officers and soldiers, and at one point it was even used to transport um, enslaved African Americans across the Mississippi River. Now the Bell remained in Confederate hands for nearly a year. Finally in March of 1862, however, there was a Union flotilla that attacked an island called Island Number 10 near New Madrid, Missouri. And when the Ohio Bell appeared in, in front of the flotilla, Union gunboats fired on it and it sort of scurried away quickly to avoid any um, actual engagement is that uh, naval battle progressed. Um, the Confederate forces realized that the island would likely be captured. So they actually uh, put a hole in the Ohio Bell and sent it down river in the hopes that it would, uh, would sink and that the, the federal troops you know, couldn't get access to it anymore. However, some uh, wily Union soldiers ended up sort of uh, recapturing the Ohio Bell, patched it up, and then the boat, which again had been uh, used by the Confederates for nearly a year, um, became a federal vessel so even though the northern owners of the boat wanted to get it back to continue river commerce, the federal government refused and they kept the Ohio Bell in Union service for several more years. And then it, uh, it, ended, up, yeah, it ended up having a, a great uh, sort of naval career as part of the Union Army. 
Um, for the next several years, you know, uh, it transported Union soldiers. We know that Union troops died on the vessel. They were wrapped in blankets and buried in the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. Um, and in one voyage, the steamboat actually took Union troops on a message on a, a mission of retribution. In September of 1862, after Confederate guerrillas had fired on um, northern boats from the town of Randolph, Tennessee, Union General William Sherman ordered that Randolph should be burned as punishment for harboring guerrillas. Um, the Ohio Bell transported Union soldiers to the town, and um, these were mainly actually Ohio soldiers who ended up uh, doing this sort of mission of retribution to punish uh, uh, Randolph, Tennessee, for this, you know, infraction of harboring guerrillas. And as the steamboat neared the shore, um, one Buckeye soldier later wrote, the quiet citizens of Randolph began to scamper like rats from a foundering vessel. Oh, but they did run. And he later added, the whole town felt their impending doom and all were satisfied that it was just, although it was hard. Now these Union troops essentially laid the town to waste. They burned every building in Randolph, Tennessee, except for the, the Methodist church that stood at the center of town. Um, approximately 60 houses were put to the torch and they only left the church basically to show that, you know, the spot where Randolph, Tennessee had once stood and this is what happened if you harbored guerrillas along the rivers. You'd be met with sort of this, this fierce, almost sort of Old Testament retribution from, from the Union Army. Now, by October 1863, the Union military had determined that smaller boats like the Ohio Bell were no longer needed for the Union war effort. Authorities then finally returned the Ohio Bell um, to its owners, who eventually received about $19,000 um, for the boat service uh, to the federal government during the Civil War. Now, According to one estimate I found, $19,000 in 1863 would be worth about uh, $600,000 today. So, you know, they did get a hefty sum for this use, but, you know, as you can imagine, uh, the boat was treated fairly roughly during its service um, in the Union, Union Army. Now, uh, the vessel, as soon as it was returned to its owners, it immediately began running trade from Cincinnati to New Orleans. And again, this was in 1862, so it was a risky proposition. But, you know, within uh, for um, a year earlier, New Orleans had fallen under Union control. So uh, essentially, uh, it was safe for this vessel to go to New Orleans at that point. It's just that, the, you know, there was risk of, of, of travel um, as it delivered freight along these rivers. And it was occasionally contracted to continually give, um, you know, uh, uh, passage to other Union troops as well. So it, it remained a Union vessel of transport during much of the Civil War, even though it wasn't officially under um, Union service. Now, during this time, you know, the Ohio Bell um, also faced, um, you know, violence and there, you know, a lot of reminders that they were indeed steaming through a war zone. In March, 1864, there was a seven year old man who lived on the Tennessee side of the Mississippi River near M New Madrid and he boarded the boat. And he said that he and three of his neighbors were chopping wood when guerrillas appeared and killed his companions. They called the man a damned old abolitionist and they ended up shooting him in the arm, arm and hand. This old man, again, about 70, crawled uh, for several miles until he reached the river. And there the Ohio Bell happened to see him. They brought him on board and sort of cared for him during that time. So, you know, the crew members on the Bell driving or riding through these war zones realized that, you know, it was still indeed dangerous to, to travel during this time. At another point, two soldiers who were traveling on board were actually severely injured when uh, guerrillas fired on board on board the vessel. But the ultimate fate of the Ohio Bell essentially mirrored the, that of the entire steamboat industry. So after the Civil War, as we all know, uh, steamboat travel declined as railroads expanded to the United States. And this was sort of a death knell for the Ohio Bell, which by the end of the conflict was you know, an aged vessel. You know, As I said, um, at this point it was well over 12 years old and most, ve most vessels only survived about five. So it had a really good run on board the Ohio rivers. And, you know, also since it has spent the war years delivering, you know, passenger or delivering soldiers and serving as a, a hospital ship, you know, I'm sure it was not in its, you know, luxurious state that it had once been in when it, you know, plied the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, only delivering passengers. Um, in the summer of 1856, an advertisement appeared in newspapers. There's one, you know, it's pictured here that the uh, federal government was selling a number of steamboats. So the feds had evidently gotten control over the bell right at the end of the war. But they were selling all these, you know, wharf boats, barges, and other properties, as it says. And, you know, dozens and dozens of vessels that were used during the Civil War were sold at New Orleans. And this included the side-wheeled steamer Ohio Bell. You know, you can see it at the bottom, you know, it's registered 300 tons. So, you know, they were making, uh, trying to make some money on getting rid of all the surplus property. Um, in uh, 
October 1865, then, the Ohio Bell sold at New Orleans to parties in Alabama for roughly $6,200. Um, and that was a far cry from its estimated value of $25,000 just a year before. So it gives you an idea, um, you know, uh, supply and demand, essentially, you know, as the federal government was selling all these boats, you know, the, the price of steamboats just plummeted at the end of the Civil War. Now, as you can imagine, being sold to parties in Alabama, the name Ohio Bell did not survive um, uh, the sale. Uh, the men who bought the boat ended up changing the name to the Alabama Bell uh, because the boat ended up traveling the Alabama River, transporting goods and passengers to Mobile, Montgomery, and other uh, communities in Alabama. Um, you know, it's probably safe to say that after the Civil War in the Deep South, having Ohio tied to your name may not have been a very good thing when uh, Buckeye soldiers were burning towns because of guerrilla depredation. So it was a probably a savvy business move uh, to save you know, the boat survived the war, but it did not, the name did not survive and it was changed to the Alabama Bell. But in September 1866, the bell was actually sold again. Newspapers ran a notice stating that capitalists and steamboat men should take note. It was another, you know, sort of uh, showing that it was, was sold on the, the auction block. Um, it was sold uh, in complete order, you know, the Alabama Bell. And um, the newspaper added, you know, it's a safe and profitable investment. She will no doubt improve invaluable. The sale, the sale should be well attended. So, you know, they expected this boat to go well, but, you know, instead, uh, instead of being sold to be a passenger vessel, in 1867, after a miraculous 12-year run on the Mississippi, Ohio, and other rivers during the war, the steamboat was broken up and it was likely sold for scrap. And so what I wonder, you know, in writing this book is the boilers and the boards were taken away as the wheel of the steamboat was plied off as the chandeliers were taken down and sort of the last nail was pulled out of this, you know, historic vessel, you know, I wonder if those sort of pulling the boards away and dismantling the ship really knew her tales and knew her history and knew the stories of, you know, the wild and desperate men who had once ridden on board, you know, this fantastic Cincinnati-based steamboat. So, you know, thank you for your time. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Um, you know, you can also follow me on Twitter too and, uh, you know, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks for having me. Great. Wow. That was awesome, Stuart. Thank you so much. I uh, put out the link um, on uh, on Twitter and uh, Facebook. So we have a, a number of individuals watching us on Facebook right now live. So oh, thanks great. to them. Yeah. And um, anybody can can watch it afterwards as well if you want to tell your friends. Um, so here's that. Well, actually, if you can, you don't have to share again, but I was okay. going to put in the chat Sure. Um, I definitely want to buy a copy of the book. Well, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about how people can do that before we get into some of the questions. And if you have a question, we still have a little bit of time. So add your question to the chat, please. Yeah, please. If you have any questions, let me know. So the book was published by the University Press of Kentucky. So it's available on their website. It's also available uh, on amazon.com and online. Um, also too, I think Joseph Beth's Hopefully, up in your neck of the woods might have it. I know they have it in uh, in Lexington as well. So if you prefer to buy from, you know, a local bookseller, you know, give uh, Joseph Beths a call and see if they have it. So thanks for that. But perfect. Uh, hope you enjoy. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's that's great. I saw uh, Paul had a question, but he was thinking. I think he kind of maybe changed his mind. Um, was wondering about Bloody Monday. So even though he kind of changed his mind about his question, maybe you could talk just a little bit more about um, maybe the role of Bloody Monday and some of the, sure. how it kind of affected later events. Yeah, and you know, you, you asked about uh, um, this one incident of the man from Corpus Christi in Newport. Um, this was later, you know, that incident was later, but both of those are sort of indicative of the, um, you know, xenophobic violence that and, and anti-immigration violence that was going on in the United States during this period is sort of the, you know, know nothing party game supremacy. You know, Kentucky actually had a know nothing governor during this period. So, um, you know, they were a, a formidable political force at one point, you know, this would have been 1855, you know, Boswald is, you know, the chat mentions was killed in November. So it's a little bit later, but again, up and down the rivers and on election days in particular, um, and I don't know the, the actual circumstances behind that case, Paul, but you know, it's all sort of part of the same um, anti-immigration movement, probably an anti-Catholic movement 
it was going on um, in Kentucky during that period. So it does not surprise me to hear that that, that actually happened. You know, there were times there was a, a Turner organization in uh, Cincinnati, which were, you know, comprised of German immigrants. You know, a number of those men were attacked at the same time. They actually armed themselves and sort of defended themselves. So, you know, this sort of xenophobic violence, unfortunately, was going viral. I mean, have only in Kentucky. And sort of Bloody Monday is probably the worst episode of that. Um, but it, it, it really sort of shocked everyone. It also, you know, that incident shows, you know, how media played a role too, because uh, the editor of the um, Louisville Journal, um, who's a man named Prentice, ended up sort of inflaming know nothing sensibilities before uh, those elections and sort of got everyone kind of ginned up. And that sort of le led to a lot of, uh, of the violence too, I think. And, you know, in my book, media plays an important role too, because after Jones killed uh, Stevens, you know, newspapers initially excoriated him for the crime and sort of, uh, even though he'd been, you know, killed by the crew, basically. Um, but after newspapers um, in the South found out that uh, Jones, who again was lynched by the crew, that he was a man of property, they sort of changed their tune and began, you know, condemning the crew for this act of vigilante justice. And they only did that after they found out that he was the son of a wealthy planter in Holly Springs, Mississippi. So, you know, one thing I look at in the book, um, you know, is sort of um, um, how, you know, wealth and status can also influence media coverage too. So that happened too. But yeah, um, one question, the upper deck of the Ohio Bell appeared to be in disarray when it was docked in Cincinnati when it was five years old. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, that was sort of a less luxurious version than the boat that was constructed in 1855. Um, you know, again, these were, even though the, the inside was luxurious, you have to imagine the outside was fairly uh, beaten up with these boats as you know, everything from horses to, you know, crates were thrown on board, um, you know, uh, uh, livestock was put on board and, you know, a number of passengers. So a lot of these images, if you look at that 1848 Cincinnati panoramic image, you'll see what real Western water steamboats look like. You know, typically we, we see the uh, romanticized versions and paintings and things like that. Uh, but typically vessels like the Ohio Bell were, were definitely built for uh, carrying freight. Um, but I think the the later version was a little bit more um, a little bit more luxurious than that one from that 1848 photo. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the book the book's 2020, not 2002. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, you know, uh, a lovely typo on my behalf. So thanks for <laughs> noticing that. Um, sorry, Terry, you mind if I answer another question real quick? Go for um, it. We have plenty of time. Okay. Uh, one question was how long was the trip from Cincinnati to New Orleans, and what was the cost for the trip? The cost varied. It was typically around, as I recall, you know, it'd be something like six or seven dollars for for you know a cabin to go from Cincinnati to New Orleans. The trip down river took about four days, um, and probably about five or six days on the way back. I do know that it cost the Ohio Bell about two hundred dollars a day to run, so it gives you an idea of of the cost involved. But you know, it was a uh, a slow trip in modern standards, um, but you know for for 1850s Americans, it was a fairly rapid journey um, going down river to, to New Orleans. And, you know, with Cincinnati being a major uh, pork producing community at that time, you know, pork was king in terms of sort of exports. That was a, uh, a, a major thing that the Ohio Bell took down river um, to not only Cincinnati, but they'd stop these other ports, you know, like Smithland, Cairo, Evansville, Indiana, you know, they were stopping pretty frequently. Um, and, you know, that's that's one reason these boats were so laden down with with goods. And uh, it's pretty amazing to see the list of things that they carried during that time period. It's kind of fun to see. Um, I'd also give a plug. There's a museum called the Arabia Steamboat Museum in Kansas City. And if you have any interest in in steamboats, this was a boat that um, ended up sinking on, I think it was the Missouri River. And the river course changed over time and essentially encapsulated this 1850s steamboat in mud. Um, a father and son team found where it was and actually raised the boat and everything within was completely and pristinely preserved. And once they washed the mud off, you know, this museum now in, in downtown uh, Kansas City is incredible because it has, I mean, anything you can imagine, you know, from this boat um, looks like it's brand new, you know, hats and boots and pocket knives and watches. And it's everything that a Western community would need uh, to sort of, uh, you know, fill a general stores in there. So if you're ever in that area, you have a, even a passing interest in 19th century history. It's definitely worth, you know, worth the visit. I send people to Beringer Crawford first and then the Arabia Steamboat Museum second. So Perfect. Oh, we have uh, Lana says she has been there and it is awesome. I actually got a question via text. 
Sure. Um, so is, let's go back to the crime for just a second, because I thought it was really interesting and, and uh, my, my texter did as well about, you know, the issue with not really being able to uh, to get this criminal like off the boat for justice, right? That they said like, well, no, it's not our jurisdiction. So we're not, you know, gonna be able, this is a murder, right? We were talking right. about. So, I mean, you mentioned that in your research, you know, unfortunately this kind of criminal activity, you know, murders were not necessarily, I'm sure regular, but they were also not completely uncommon in this time. Was that standard that the captain would just sort of dole out justice as they please or what would happen normally murder was a little bit different typically the captain would you know uh dole out justice if it was a robbery or an assault or uh you know something like that if it was and i hate to call it a lesser crime but when it wasn't a murder you know typically especially if it was if it was a thief i mean they would deal with them harshly and as i mentioned they would you know beat people they would flog people they would shave half your head um, which is sort of the mark of a criminal. And that lasted well up into the Civil War. You know, if a Union soldier stole from a comrade, they'd, you know, flog him and shave half his head and discharge him from the army. It was sort of a mark of shame. Um, and so typically, you know, the captain would dole out this sort of riverine form of justice. And it was well understood. Um, but sometimes, you know, there were men, one, one episode I mentioned in the book is uh, there's a man who was probably falsely accused who was nearly beaten to death. Um, they took him on shore and, you know, several people beat him. Um, but they never found the money and he claimed his innocence throughout. So, you know, it was not really justice at all. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, vigilantism at its worst, um, really. But, you know, for something like a murder, they would typically, um, well, not always. I mean, there were lynchings on board, things like that. And then the crew and passengers who, again, were sort of used to this happening in their own communities really wouldn't say anything. Um, you know, Matilda Heron, fortunately, you know, she spared Jones at least, you know, a few hours of his life by making this plea for justice. But, you know, the, the, the courts at that time were definitely weighted in favor of the wealthy, um, you know, were definitely weighted in favor of the socially prominent. Um, if, if a concealed weapon was pulled, especially that held true if, um, if you know, both parties were armed. Um, but, you know, Southern honor culture plays a big role in this book. And I talk a lot about a lot about that. That's sort of, you know, how did your society perceive you as a white Southern male? And that would sort of, uh, you know, reflect how you treated others. And, and the main thing you wanted to avoid was shame. And so for Jones, having this lower class clerk, you know, grab him and manhandle him out of the room, you know, if he didn't respond to that insult in his community, in his mind, you know, it would be sort of uh, the brand of cowardice and shame um, as one historian writes, you know, would haunt him forever is kind of, you know, how it was looked at. So, you know, Southern honor is sort of interesting, too, because, you know, if if let's say a uh, another wealthy Mississippian had insulted uh, Jones in Holly Springs, Mississippi, he probably would have challenged the man to a duel. I um, mean, you know, duels were not infrequent. You know, if you, if any of you are uh, fan, fans of uh, Hamilton, you know, the 10 rules of the duel and, uh, you know, um, men of equal social status, if you were upper class would duel. But, you know, if you were dealing with sort of a lower class person, you would typically either cane them or you'd horse with them um, on the street. And so there were often times where uh, newspaper editors, they wrote a critical editorial that an upper class Southerner didn't like. They'd catch him on the street and would beat him with a cudgel. And, you know, um, violence was, was, was pretty terrible during this time period, um, as you can imagine. And, uh, you know, the, the book and the, the topic and uh, a few of the themes I talk about really reflects that. Um, one question in the chat, if you don't mind uh, me, me, you know, noting this, Tara, the, uh, the weapons were not as often concealed at that time. Typically, there were concealed weapons a lot. Um, you know, there, there was a, a noted Kentucky attorney named uh, Ben Harden, who's from Bardstown, who referred to a certain class of Southerner as the Bowie knife and pistol gentry. And uh, they were seen as being extremely touchy, um, you know, being sort of stuck in this honor cast. Um, it was said that they would, you know, pull a pistol if a cat tread on their toe is one line that I found. Um, but they did frequently carry concealed weapons and it was a sort of a class thing. And um, there's one early, uh, well, 1950s, 1960s historian who really attributes these uh, um, sort of uh, Southerners carrying concealed weapons, you know, ties it to slavery. He says that Southerners always went around armed because the risk of slaves attacking them or slave rebellion was sort of ever present in their mind. They had this constant paranoia. They'd be attacked by their own enslaved African-Americans. So therefore, they constantly carried either knives or pistols. And this became, you know, part of society. And they frequently, um, you know, went around armed. And, uh, you know, I think it was tied to slavery, but it then became sort of a cultural thing for people. 
um, at that time. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the mix of alcohol and gambling and concealed weapons became a pretty volatile mix and, you know, led to a number of murders, not only on steamboats, but also in, in communities, too. Up, you're muted. I was uh, just happy, no, happily noting that I uh, wasn't around in the uh, 1850s. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I like penicillin too, you know, right? not, you know, not as much violence and also, you know, modern medicine. Absolutely. So, here's the big question for you to yeah. uh, finish out our evening, which is sure. what's your next project? So the book I sort of put on hold is actually about a duel that was fought near Maysville, Kentucky during the Civil War between a Union colonel and a pro-Confederate civilian. And it has sort of a Southern honor focus to that too, but uh, um, the duel was fought in May of 1862. And it sort of looks at um, the secession crisis through the lens of this duel, because it was the se secession crisis and the arrest of this pro-Confederate civilian that really started the duel. So it examines kind of the secession crisis, this duel, but then it also looks at the evolution of violence in Kentucky um, from, you know, around the 1850s through the Civil War and then beyond, because Kentucky's, you know, one reason, you know, I hate to say it, we have a terrible reputation among some other states, and that existed during the 19th century, because Kentucky was seen as a uh, extremely violent place, and so I'm sort of looking at why was that, you know, and concealed weapons played a big part in that, and, uh, you know, sort of the, the honor culture of being easily offended stayed in Kentucky, but the sort of formal uh, rules of the duel, which is called the code duello, went away. So essentially violence became deregulated among upper class white Southerners. And, you know, when they were insulted, you know, in the 1850s, they would have sent a challenge note to duel. But by 1870, 1880, they would instead pull concealed weapons and would shoot one another. And it's really scary to see the number of people who, you know, in public places would end up pulling uh, pistols when they were either insulted by someone or, or saw sort of a public enemy. Um, you know, these were prominent men, these were politicians, um, these were uh, wealthy people of note. This was not sort of uh, kind of, you know, rugged violence uh, um, between, you know, two uh, ditch diggers, for example. This was, um, you know, the head of the Republican Party in Kentucky, you know, uh, ended up murdering another man in the Lexington Post Office in broad daylight. If one had a pistol, one had a knife. Um, and surprisingly, the man with the knife ended up surviving. So, you know, this happened fairly frequently. And, uh, you know, so the book explores kind of not only this duel, but also, you know, why was that happening in Kentucky and how did it end up affecting our, our state's reputation after the war? Wow. Well, now, uh, once that is finished and out, we uh, expect you back to talk about I'd love to. Thanks. Well. <laughs> and this, is, this has been a lot of fun. And thank you so much for having me. And I, you know, if I may, you know, I, I work in the public history field myself now, and um, I really appreciate the work that the Barringer Crawford Museum does. Um, you know, I appreciate the, you know, uh, involvement of the board. It's always been a wonderful board there. So, you know, anyone who's watching who's not a, a member of Barringer Crawford, you know, I definitely encourage you to join and, and help out this important organization that does so much for, you know, education in Northern Kentucky. Wow, well, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And um, I think we're about finished. We're out of time, but uh, this has been a really fun conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And now, um, like I said, really looking forward to uh making a trip to Joseph Beth um, if one's well, get across the river. Um, <laughs> it's a little tricky to do that at this moment, but right. um, we um, have um, a couple of updates that I want to make sure that I share with the group before we say goodbye. First of all, we will be taking a week off next week for everyone to celebrate with their families. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And then we will be back uh, the following Wednesday, which I'm pretty sure is December 2nd. And Blanche Sullivan, who is on this call and has been um, a very loyal audience member since the beginning when we talked about Lolo Lagoon, she is um, a member of the uh, Speakers Bureau for the Cincinnati Museum Center, and she is going to be giving a presentation about holiday traditions in Cincinnati, Greater Cincinnati in Northern Kentucky to kick off the holiday season. So we cannot wait to hear from Blanche. Blanche, your pen is in the mail, by the way. And um, for all of you, we hope you have a wonderful evening and a happy holiday, Stuart. So nice to meet you. And take nice to meet you. Day. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.